My name is Roger Buck, and today we're going to talk about what once made Ireland different. Different from England, different from America, different from the rest of the Anglosphere, and certainly different from the contemporary globalist project, which it seems to me at any rate, is bent on reducing people to a homogenized, monotonous, same size fits all condition, um, and bent on leading us into an increasingly progressive, secular, liberal, also capitalist um, ethos, and to focus on why and how Ireland was once different to all of this. We're going to go back to 1916, specifically the Easter Rising of 1916, where rebels took over strategic buildings, mainly in Dublin, mainly actually the Dublin Post Office. And this is what led to Irish independence from the British Empire. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm actually going to um, mainly be reading you from my book, Cor Jesu Sacritissimum, where I go into Ireland a lot. I mean, really, um, Ireland has formed so, mu so much of the inspiration for this book, and indeed my other book, The Gentle Traditionalist, there's links to those down below. Um, but I won't just be reading to you. Uh, we'll also be bringing up a lot of pictures on the screen, and then I'm going to interject um, some of my own commentary as we go along. Um, and anyway, but let's just begin with reading a bit. Um, it's a slightly rewritten version um, from what appears in the book. The modern Irish state was born from armed revolt in 1916. On Easter Monday of that year, a few men, including Patrick Pierce, James Connolly, and Emon de Valera, spearheaded a violent insurrection in Dublin setting off a chain of events that, astonishingly, led to Irish liberation in the South by 1922. It is astonishing because back in 1916, the prospect of Irish freedom remained utterly inconceivable. No country had ever succeeded in breaking free from the superpower of that time the mighty British Empire, on which, famously or infamously, the sun never set. Apart, that is, of course, from the American colonies in 1776, who were aided by the French. And, having suffered British domination for centuries, most Irish assumed their situation could easily continue a few further centuries more. At the time then, the Easter Rising of 1916 appeared not simply hopeless, but indeed howlingly, ridiculously absurd. The devout Patrick Pierce, however, thought differently and prepared to sacrifice his life for his vision that Ireland might be free. Commandeering Dublin's General Post Office, hardly the centre of government, Pierce walked out onto its front steps at four minutes past noon and proclaimed a free Irish Republic to astonished onlookers. Here is a little of what he said to the dumbfounded passers-by outside the General Post Office, or GPO, as it is known for short. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessing we invoke upon our arms. Now, the Easter Rising is generally considered a revolution. Yet, in certain ways, it shares more in common with, say, 
Catholic counter-revolutionary movements elsewhere. As Mary Kenny, in her book, Goodbye to Catholic Ireland, writes of the 1916 insurrection. During the rebels' occupation of strategic buildings in Dublin during Easter week, the rosary was recited on the hour, every hour, a practice which Irish revolutionaries, to the head-clutching bewilderment of, say, French radicals, considered natural. Mary Kenny is right. The so-called Irish Revolution would have discombobulated revolutionaries elsewhere. For these Irish revolutionaries were not fighting against a Catholic order. Instead, they fought for the liberty to secure a Catholic culture very different to England's Protestant society. In contrast to revolutions elsewhere, the Ireland they were fighting for was not a more secular society, but in fact one that would prove far less secular. Few things convey that manifestly less secular attitude better than the constitution that the Irish would later vote for following their liberation. For that constitution, celebrated here in an Irish stamp from 1937, would have been unthinkable to liberal England, forbidding as it did things like divorce and commencing with the following preamble. In the name of the most holy trinity, from whom is all authority and to whom as our final end all actions both of men and states must be referred we the people of ireland humbly acknowledging all our obligations to our divine lord jesus christ who sustained our fathers through centuries of trial gratefully remembering their heroic and unremitting struggle to regain the rightful independence of our nation and seeking to promote the common good. Do hereby adopt, enact and give to ourselves this constitution. Now, my interpretation here of the Rising as a Catholic revolt against the Protestant secular British spirit would have been a common one in Ireland 50 years ago, but today secular revisionists may challenge it. They will point out, for example, that a few figures involved definitely did not share such aims. For example, James Connolly's goals were certainly more socialist than Catholic, and there were a few, very few, Protestants involved. Such things are sometimes asserted to minimize the Catholic dimension of the rising. Such arguments collapse, however, when we consider the remarkable Catholic piety not only displayed by the rising's leaders, including Patrick Pierce, Amon de Valera and Amon Kant, but also the vast rank and file of those who followed them into battle. Let us consider what Fiergal McGarry writes in a recent and definitely secular book on the history of the Easter Rising. Volunteers were armed not only with guns, but rosary beads, scapulars, and holy water. Confessions were heard, conditional absolution was granted, and the rosary was endlessly recited. One GPO volunteer recalled, "'Twas not an unusual sight to see a volunteer with his rifle grasped firmly in his hands and his rosary beads hanging from his fingers. Every man in the place went to confession, recalled one of the Jacob's garrison. There were many incongruous scenes. In the GPO, a priest set up a confessional 
beside the ammunition dump. And McGarry also speaks of how Elis Ryan described Father Augustine's spiritual support. Rosary after rosary was recited during the last 24 hours as the British military were closing in on the area. The firing was intense on Saturday. Father Augustine was still on his knees. He consoled the wounded and staff alike and prayed for the success of the men in action. McGarry also offers this account of how one volunteer described how he surprised Amon Kant, commandant of the 3rd Battalion, during a lull in the fighting. I knocked, opened the door, and saw him kneeling in the room, his rosary beads in his hand and the tears running down his cheeks. During the week, some of the fellows began to cry when they heard shots because they were a long time from confession, one of the Marabone Lane volunteers recalled. Father Kieran and another priest came down from Mount Argus, and they gave us all Agnes Days. Now, although it had originally been intended for Easter Sunday, organizational difficulties delayed the rising till Monday. Here, it is striking how McGarry describes the scenes in churches that weekend. For most volunteers, their preparation for the rising began with religious devotions at the weekend. The scenes in almost every chapel on Saturday night were amazing. The chapels were crowded with men and boys from confession. Similar scenes were witnessed on the Sunday morning, thousands of men and boys receiving Holy Communion. Putting McGarry down now, I am going to add, this latter fact assumes greater importance when we realize that although mass attendance was extremely high in Catholic Ireland, actually receiving his body and blood still remained infrequent. Generally speaking, Catholics during those pre-Vatican II times often felt unfit to receive. However, these men not only felt fit, they sought out communion with our Lord for what they knew might well prove the final time. And, as McGarry further explains, the rising assumed a supernatural dimension for many of those involved, witnessing as they did miraculous occurrences, such as the rebel saved from a sniper's bullet when he kneeled for the Angelus, or the picture of the crucifixion left untouched although the wall all around was torn with bullet marks. And rising leader Tom Clark's wife Kathleen, who experienced an epiphany after the rising, was not alone in describing the Easter rising in the religious language of apparition, divine mission and sacrifice. Yet perhaps the greatest testimony to a miraculous dimension here lies in the staggering fact that against every odd, the rising worked. Six years later, Ireland was free. Even though virtually all the leaders of the Easter Rising were immediately executed by the British, following swift victory by their vastly superior forces. Indeed, when the Easter Rising leaders occupied those few strategic buildings in Dublin, they obviously recognised their cause was completely hopeless in military terms. Yet, knowing they would certainly be executed, they chose to sacrifice their lives for a gesture they believed would galvanize the Irish people. Incredibly, their belief proved true. For the rising leaders were shortly perceived as martyrs and inspired the Irish to rebel like never before. 
In six short years, the British lost the hold on the nation they had held for over seven centuries. And here, reader, I am prepared to venture something very controversial in modern Ireland. For many now criticise Pierce and the Rising's bloodshed, and speaking personally, it also troubled me for many years. Yet, the Rising remains one of the most extraordinary true stories I have ever read. Indeed, at face value, it, it appears completely bizarre. Before the Rising, Patrick Pierce had been an introspective schoolteacher and by many accounts possessed an overly sensitive, even timid nature. According to one story, Pierce was so upset by accidentally killing a worm in his garden that he gave up work for the day. Yet, Patrick Pierce was mysteriously transformed into a man who sacrificed his life to seize a post office, of all things. Moreover, he proclaimed himself leader of a then inconceivable Irish Republic, a republic that shortly and shockingly came to happen by and through his death. Personally, I think of the likewise very strange, very improbable story of St. Joan of Arc and cannot help but wonder if the intensely religious Patrick Pierce experienced too a mystical, albeit never recorded, inspiration. All right, friends, I'm going to stop reading for just a few moments and make a little bit of personal commentary here. I'd like to draw your attention to the words that I just said in my book that I cannot help but wondering. That means this is just personal speculation. I also said that this issue of the rising troubled me for many years. Um, you know, five or six years ago, I could never have written um, what I've written in that book because I was still deeply troubled by it at that time. And yeah, I had to sort of balance different issues in my mind. And so on the one hand, I had to take seriously, and it's important to take seriously, the bloodshed that was involved with the rising. Now, I think something like um, in that initial rising led by Patrick Pierce, 500 people were killed. Um, the majority were the combatants, the British soldiers and the Irish volunteers, but there were some innocent civilian deaths. And it's a very striking factor of me to me how much in Ireland today is made of the fact of that loss of innocent lives. I mean, the American Revolution cost far, far more. The French Revolution cost even more. You go to France, you don't hear anybody, anybody. Well, I might be exaggerating, but, you know, um, you know, the French don't seem to have any of that kind of remorse, um, even though the French Revolution was, the atrocities are, are off the scale compared to um, the Easter Rising. But yes, there's a lot of criticism in Ireland um, about the innocent lives lost in the Rising. And it's important to be concerned about the loss of innocent lives. Uh, and I'll come back to that. But, you know, another whole factor is the question of whether the Rising is a just war. And by the classic criteria of what a just war is, it has to be said that it isn't. Um, a just war, uh, among other things, is premised on um, the conflict being winnable. And, as I say, by all ordinary standards of judgment, this conflict was not winnable. Um, now, it's very, very strange that in the end, it, it you know, Pierce, Pierce won. Very, very mysterious. But at the time, it looked just beyond belief stupid. Um, so, yeah, that all led me to St. John of Arc. Because, you know, if you look at that whole conflict um, back in the 15th century, um, 
it certainly doesn't look like a just war that St. Joan of Arc was leading. I mean, we can't go into all the details, but here it's relevant to say that back at that time, Britain and France were sort of very, very enmeshed. You know, Britain was taking over French culture the way it took over Irish culture. And St. Joan of Arc led a military campaign that um, established France on her own feet. And that, for that reason, even today, even non-religious, you know, uh, French, secular people, even anti-Catholic secular people in France celebrate Joan of Arc because they see her as a key figure, which is true, in establishing French identity. And that's important to the French. The French are very concerned with things like GAFA, um, G-A-F-A, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, um, what they see as the Anglo-Saxon, as they call it, domination of world culture. So Joan of Arc is very important um, for what she did for establishing French identity separate from Anglo-Saxon world domination, as you would find French people say today. And yes, there is a certain parallel that Patrick Pierce was concerned about the Irish having their own separate culture and identity. Now, I'm not saying that Patrick Pierce was a saint um, um, like St. Joan of Arc. It's very mysterious. The church, you know, has decreed Joan of Arc a saint, even though I'm not sure you can call that a just war. So there's profound paradoxes and questions here. But moving on, um, yeah, there are things that are you know, troubling about Patrick Pierce. He did say some strange and disturbing things at times, although most of us say some strange and disturbing things at times. I think some of his rhetoric was quite excessive. Um, and I had to, you know, I had to really feel into who Patrick Pierce was. You know, so I started reading his biographies and looking at his letters and reading some of his poetry and, and, and writings, feeling into the man because I had to struggle with this issue. And yeah, um, I think I'm just going to read you um, a couple of things that he said after, the, um, after he was fa you know, facing execution. So here is Pierce at his court-martial before the British. I admit that I was commandant general commanding in chief the forces of the Irish Republic which have been acting against you for the past week and that I was president of their provisional government. When I was a child of ten I went down on my bare knees by my bedside one night and promised God that I should devote my life to an effort to free my country. I have kept that promise. As a boy and as a man, I have worked for Irish freedom. First, among all earthly things, I have helped to organize, to arm, to train and to discipline my fellow countrymen to the sole end that when the time came, they might fight for Irish freedom. The time, as it seemed to me, did come and we went into fight. I am glad we did. We seem to have lost. We have not lost. To refuse to fight would have been to lose. To fight is to win. We have kept faith with the past and handed on a tradition to the future. And more softly, um, I'm going to read you his last letter to his mother. Are written, I believe, on the day that he was executed by the British. I have just received Holy Communion. I am happy, except for the great grief of parting from you. This is a death I should have asked for if God had given me the choice of all deaths. To die a soldier's death for Ireland and for freedom. We have done right. People will say hard things of us now, but later on they will praise us. Do not grieve for all of this, but think of it as a sacrifice which God asked of me and of you. Goodbye again, dear, dear mother. May God bless you for your great love for me and for your great faith, and may he remember 
all that you have so bravely suffered. I hope soon to see Papa, and in a little while we shall all be together again. Mother, goodbye. I have not words to tell my love of you, and how my heart yearns for you. All, I will call to you in my heart at the last moment. Your son, Pat. All right, friends. Just from those few lines, I think we sense um, a quite remarkable individual. As I was saying, I've read a lot more than those few lines in my own struggle to get to what's real here. I've read a lot of Pierce, and the more that I read him, the more I became convinced of a very extraordinary man, um, a man with remarkable and profound depths, a man who in his introversion, in his piety, in his prayerfulness, um, things were happening in his soul, things that may never have been recorded or shared. He led in some ways quite a hermit-like life, uh, mainly in contact with his brother, but very, very private. And I am, yes, as I said, I cannot help but wonder if there is a mystical dimension here that has never been recorded. Just my private speculation. But, yes, that grows out of really sensing um, the depths, the profound depths of Patrick Pierce. But it's also, again, it's a reflection on the, what was seen, the miraculous nature of the rising that he believes by giving up his life like this, by courageously giving up his life and taking over a post office, um, that somehow he will change the course of Irish history. And he does. You know, six years later, um, the British Empire has been defeated by things he set in motion. And it doesn't seem to me, is it like a freak accident? Is 1916 just a bad joke? No, I don't think so. I think there are extraordinary and transcendent forces at work here. Now, spiritual forces. Now, spiritual isn't necessarily good. Some people could say, well, maybe there are spiritual forces. Maybe they're malevolent forces. All I can say to you right now in this short video, friends, is that in my own personal heart, after years of struggle, and again, I had to struggle with this, you know, for all through my youth, I was a great, deep admirer of Gandhi, of Gandhi's non-violent um, fight for Indian independence. You know, Patrick Pierce was very tough for me to come to terms with uh, because, of, because of that kind of background. Uh, but in my own struggle, I have come to this personal conviction that the rising was miraculous and that divine providence was involved in the rising, that divine providence was involved in Ireland establishing her own separate and different culture, just like divine providence was involved in St. Joan of Arc um, taking the same direction for France. Now that does not need mean to say that Patrick Pierce or anyone else is a saint here, because God doesn't only work through saints. And, you know, there are many souls who can be instruments of God's will. I mean, thank God, if, if, if God only works with saints and nobody else, um, we would be in a pretty tough position. No, there are many instruments of God's will who are not, who do not reach the apex of saintliness. It does not mean that everything that Patrick Pierce or everyone else did in the rising was pure and unfolding pure and unfallen and holy? No. Um, the rising is a messy human affair, like all human affairs are. It's murky, it's paradoxical. Um, nonetheless, I have come to the conviction that divine providence was working through the rising. And I'm going to come back to that at the end of the video. Um, also, maybe say a little bit more on this issue of the bloodshed. But right now, I want to get to my book where, go back to reading from my book, where I continue talking about Amon de Valera, because in many ways, Amon de Valera carried on the legacy of Patrick Pierce. But let us move on to another noble figure of the Easter Rising. For a single rebel leader was not executed by the British, 
At the last minute, Amon de Valera was extended a mysterious reprieve which remains enigmatic to this day. As a result, he would become in time the new country's leader, spending more than 20 years as Prime Minister and another 14 as President. De Valera was a devout Catholic, going to Mass daily. Indeed, in 1928, he experienced a mystical vision of Christ, which profoundly affected him till the end of his days. De Valera also founded the nationalist conservative Fianna Fáil Republican Party, but a party with a very different attitude to, for example, today's nationalist conservative Republicans in America. And few things illustrate that difference better than a speech Emil de Valera gave on St. Patrick's Day, 1943. The Ireland which we have dreamed of would be the home of a people who valued material wealth only as a basis of right living, of a people who were satisfied with frugal comfort and devoted their leisure to things of the spirit, a land whose countryside would be bright with cosy homesteads, whose fields and villages would be joyous with the sounds of industry, whose firesides would be forums for the wisdom of serene old age. It would be, in a word, a home of a people living the life that God desires that men should live. Dear reader, I invite you to reflect a moment on the electoral prospects of politicians elsewhere calling for frugality, things of the spirit, forums of serene wisdom and money only as a basis for the life that God desires that men should live. Do not phrases like political suicide spring to mind? Yet, Amon de Valera was repeatedly elected leader. Plainly, his dream was no solitary reverie. It inspired countless Irish souls for half a century. Yes, Ireland once actively aspired to be a different society from the colonizing capitalist British Colossus to the east, which was widely perceived as materialistic and decadent. All right, friends, we're going to make some concluding comments. Not too long, I hope, because really the purpose of this video, as I indicated earlier, is just to give a brief introductory sketch of things that I want to develop about Ireland in more detail in future videos. In that context, I'll just mention that I've started making playlists, and there's a playlist for Catholic Ireland. And that way we'll be adding video after video, I hope, um, and those people who are mainly interested in what I want to say about Ireland can just go to that playlist and there's going to be a little well, already is actually a Chester Bellock playlist and so on and so forth so different playlists are coming to explore the different themes that I want to unfold in this channel but anyway in closing um I want to say a few things about uh, De Valera or Dev Dev was what he was affectionately known for short in his time um and I think I'll start by saying about that speech I read you, about De Valera's dream of Ireland. In contemporary modern Ireland, that speech is mocked. It's mocked again and again and again. Actually, I shouldn't say necessarily Ireland, contemporary modern Ireland. To my mind, it's like there is this so-called sophisticated Ireland um, that's materialistic and it's cynical and it's centered in the elites 
and it's an overlay. It's an overlay over um, an Ireland that's very different underneath. You know, I had a comment in the comments box from an Irish American saying that he was thinking differently of moving to Ireland because I was suggesting um, that Ireland had been destroyed. Um, maybe I've stated this point too strongly, but I actually want to make a rectification there. Friends, I love this country. I love it because I can still feel what I'm calling the real Ireland underneath this overlay, this cynical and so-called sophisticated globalist overlay. Um, I've lived in something like seven different countries, actually, if you count England, Wales and Scotland um, as different countries, which I think they should be counted as different countries, then I've lived in nine different countries. And really, there are qualities here in Ireland that I don't experience in any other of those nine countries. There are still very, very special qualities here. There's something deeply moving here. But anyway, in this sophisticated um, overlay, that speech by Dev is mocked. And I want to say, there's nothing wrong with that speech. What's wrong with that speech? What's wrong? with wanting to orient people away from materialism, from money? What's wrong with calling for a life where people can be happy and contemplate things of the Spirit? There's nothing wrong with that speech. But it certainly doesn't jive with, you know, our current progressive, liberal, capitalist ethos. And in that ethos, it's necessary to mock De Valera. It's necessary to uh, reduce him anyway. I've now spent a lot of time pondering Dev's life, reading uh, various biographies of the man, um, including the very secular biographies, trying to look at, at him from different angles, um, reading his political speeches, um, asking who was this being? And the more I've looked at him, the more I've come to the conclusion that there is a very, very noble spirit here indeed. Um, and I think there's a lot of lies and a lot of misinformation about him um, in modern globalist Ireland. But maybe even that's unfair. It's like when I read some of the secular biographies, I almost get the sense of autism. It's a strong word, but I'll tell you what I mean. There's one author I'm thinking of in particular. I won't mention him, but it's like at one level, he's very, very learned. He knows all the facts about Dev, but he doesn't seem to me to have the capacity to sympathetically and imaginatively enter into Dev and ask and understand what really motivated this man. As I said, his comprehension seems to me almost autistic. And in this so-called sophisticated modern Ireland, um, imagination, um, which you need to understand someone like Dev, religious imagination, is often limited. Um, so, yes, anyway, I find that I'm finding that not only am I finding Dev noble, that more and more... I grow to love this, this, this soul, just like I love Belloc and Chesterton. And in fact, there are real parallels there between Dev, Belloc and Chesterton that I would like to explore, hopefully, in videos in the future, because the vision that Dev had of Ireland and which he tried to realize was and is definitely along the lines of the distributism as an alternative to capitalism that the Chester Belloc um, were also very committed to trying to propose. Anyway, on that note, it should be said that Dev's um, aspirations have been widely regarded as a failure. And understandably, the Irish economy did very poorly. And one of the results of that was that there was massive emigration out of Ireland. Ireland was hemorrhaging its people. Obviously, there's real suffering involved in that. But while we're speaking about Dev, I'm just going to throw out some questions. I actually find myself asking, um, has a little bit too much been made of this?
Um, because it's a fact that all kinds of European countries had emigration in this time. Uh, my own parents, my British parents, emigrated from Britain in 1957 to go to um, America, um, searching for something um, better. Um, now, Irish emigration was, was, you know, worse than Britain, um, definitely. But Ireland faced a situation where it didn't have the same natural resources, the same sort of coal and iron and things like that that other countries had. All of this gets very, very complex. But yes, the modern progressive and capitalist establishment of Ireland all finds that as weapons to use against de Valera. I'm not saying that there's not, you know, truth there. And it's more than we can go into now. But I want to raise questions about de Valera because what de Valera was about was this different Ireland. This Ireland that would not go down the same social and economically liberal path as Britain. And he's now pictured as obsessed about that. He's seen as bent, bent on economically destructive policies because he was obsessed with isolating Ireland from the modern world. There's a big topic here, but I want to flag a recent episode I did Episode 16, after the terribly tragic abortion referendum we recently had here in Ireland. It was a very major episode for this channel, which I called the Indoctrination of Ireland. And I considered how very much Ireland has lost in becoming globalised. And just maybe Dev wasn't as obsessed as our brave, new, liberal and capitalist world makes out. Maybe Dev was actually a prophet. Maybe he could see, better than most people, all that Ireland stood to lose, and that's why he tried so valiantly to protect Ireland. Big, big topic. Too much to go into now, but if you check out episode 16, you may get a sense of what I mean. And anyway, in a roundabout way, all of this brings me back to the subject of the bloodshed of the Easter Rising, because I find myself thinking about this abortion referendum. Um, as I said in previous videos, abortion was introduced into Britain in 1967, and we haven't started killing babies here in Ireland for 50 years. We're only now beginning to follow Britain. And I ask myself, what would have happened if Ireland um, had remained closely united with Britain? Um, if the 1916 revolution had never happened? It's a complex topic because maybe um, there, there were moves afoot for some kind of Irish devolution. We won't go into all the complex issues, but it's very imaginable that abortion would have been introduced into Ireland much earlier than 2018. So, for all we know, these are huge, unfathomable questions. Um, the Easter Rising um, of 1916 saved babies' lives that would have been being killed in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. These are huge, unfathomable things. Um, I'm only seeking to stimulate thought and raise questions. For now, the key thing I'm saying here is that Patrick Pierce and Emon de Valera dedicated their lives, indeed were willing to sacrifice their lives for the vision of an Ireland that would be different. And now in the current globalist homogenization of the world, more than ever, I think there's a need to look to them, whatever their mistakes, look to them and cherish and guard that different vision of Ireland. You know, Dev presided over an Ireland for 50, 60 years that had such a different outlook and he was repeatedly elected, as I've said. The Irish people were behind this different vision of Ireland. I'm throwing out the question there. Did that save the lives of Irish babies, at least for a while? I think it may have. I also believe that it brought different, 
and incalculable spiritual benefits to the Irish people. Now, so much more that I'd like to say. You know, I'd like to talk about that vision of Christ that Dev had at Blackrock College in 1928. Or I'd like to talk about how Dev went to Mass daily. Um, because, friends, I think there's something so important there. Yes, once a week Mass is a great thing. And the people that are faithful to the Church in that way, I celebrate. I absolutely celebrate. But for those of us who can get to Mass more frequently, um, as I've been saying in other videos, there's a fire. There's a fire that one begins to feel if one is able to get to Mass very frequently or daily. And there was a time back in that old Ireland where huge portion of the population, we'll go into this in another video, um, was going to Mass very frequently indeed. The sacraments, the sacraments are a key part of that Catholic Ireland that I want to explore. Indeed, I do explore it um, in my two books, both Cor Jesu Sacratissimum, which I've read from today, and also my earlier um, little book, it's a more introductory book, The Gentle Traditionalist. All right, friends, that wraps it up for now. I just want to thank people for commenting on the videos, for liking the videos, for sharing the videos, or subscribing. Please keep it up. It all helps what I'm trying to do here. And also make another request. Wherever you are, please say a prayer for Ireland. Maybe light a candle for Ireland. Or offer a mass for Ireland. Ireland needs your prayers. So that's all I'm going to say now. Except, of course, thank you for listening. And God bless you.